So uh, the sh marks for the short answer questions, or the multiple choice questions, have been updated to reflect uh, our discussion last Tuesday. Uh, and also one error that I made on the marking key for form C. So if you had form C, you might have got one extra mark. I think so students got between zero and three marks increased. Uh, and the average went up from 54% to 64%, which is much more in line with the 70% average on the short answer. So I was happy to see that. Um, the, uh, the plan for today is mostly to talk about uh, assessing acceptability, but there's a couple of bits of housekeeping to do beforehand. Uh, specifically, we have to vote on the revised syllabus. So on the original syllabus, today was supposed to be a test. I didn't bring a test for you to write, so there's not going to be a test today, uh, but uh, we do have to figure out when we're going to write that test. So uh, if you don't mind, we'll just do it by hands, and if it's close, I'll do a careful count. But uh, So if you would like to accept the proposed, the proposed revision to the syllabus, please raise your hand. Okay, And if you'd like to reject, please raise your hand. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So now that is the new official revised syllabus. It's on Blackboard. Uh, so the test, I believe, is in one or two weeks now. So we'll actually have some material between now and then to test you on. Uh, great. So uh, thank you all. I was only slightly nervous that you would reject that. I don't see why you would have, but uh, I'm glad that you didn't. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, the acceptability of premises. We're going to talk about that on Thursday as well. Uh, I'm mostly going to do some like philosophy with you today, actually. Uh, I know I don't, I always apologize when I do philosophy with and or at you, but I think it's useful. Um, so, but very quickly, we're, I'd like to do just one more argument analysis. So we got through, there were two on the sheet on uh, Thursday. We got through one of them. Maybe we'll just really quickly do the other one. Uh, we'll just do it together. Practicing that is a really good use of your time because that's the skills. These are the seven things that you're going to do on your argument analyses, the two major written components, and there's going to be an argument analysis on the final exam as well. So there's three things that make up a really major portion of the remainder of your mark in this class, and they're all argument analyses, and they're all basically the same thing. Identify the conclusion, identify the premises, map the structure, and then assess the uh, acceptability of the premises, the relevance to the conclusion, and the adequacy of the argument as a whole, and then consider counterarguments. So those are the steps. Those are the steps that you should pretty much more or less always be doing when you're assessing an argument, at least in your head. Uh, and these are the things that we're going to be doing formally for most of the rest of the class. Like most of the rest of the class is filling in the details of each of these steps in more and more sort of rich and complex layers. Uh, so let's just practice this. OK, so here is the argument from last time. I'll just read it through, and then we'll do the, let's do the second method that I talked about. Instead of going through sentence by sentence, we'll just try to extract the big ideas. Uh, and I think I said on Thursday, this was, in my opinion, the worst of the two arguments. It's not a good argument. Uh, I'm not presenting this to you as an example of how to argue for sure. So keep that in mind. But let's, OK, so I'll go through this. So, uh, I've been a vegetarian almost my entire life. Everybody should be vegetarian. There's no reason people should consume meat. Also, eating meat should not be a choice, either because people are polluting our planet and killing animals. People only have a choice for anything as long as they're not harming anybody or anything else around them with their choice. People are harming everything and everybody else when they eat meat, either directly or indirectly. Therefore, meat should be banned and everybody should be required to be vegetarian. Eating meat should be illegal. Okay. So... Uh, somebody asked last time, can there be more than one conclusion in an argument? I think that there are at least two conclusions here. Uh, so this was meant to be an argument for or against vegetarianism, and they, they give one, right? So, okay. So uh, what, are at what is at least one conclusion from this argument? Yeah. Sorry, is it not on the thing? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. There we go. Okay, so now you can see it again. Yeah. Eating meat should be illegal. So let's call that conclusion one. Good. Illegal. All right. 
I think there's also a weaker conclusion here, and a sort of a weaker conclusion that's not as defended, but is nonetheless still present. Yeah. Everyone should be vegetarian. Everyone should be vegetarian. Good. Do that over here. So C two. So I take it that these are separate conclusions, right? Uh, one might lead to the other. They might be related. But nonetheless, you can hold that everyone should be vegetarian without holding that eating meat should be illegal, right? I think that's like this eating meat should be illegal is a stronger version of this than, I, than most people would defend, right? Most people who are vegetarians would say something like C2, yeah? And I think the C2 has really just got one premise. There's just one premise in this, in this little mini argument, right? I would say uh, there's no reason people should consume meat. Yeah? Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you as like a, as like a mini argument here? No reason to eat meat. Therefore, everyone should be vegetarian. I don't know. This is, this is how I would have intuitively parsed this, as two separate arguments for two separate conclusions. And one of the arguments is just very short. Just like P1 leads to the conclusion. Yeah? And then, yeah. Um, maybe, yeah. Yeah, that's, so that's reasonable. OK, so uh, let's have this as a sub argument. So what we can do now is uh, we've got this carved off as a kind of sub argument. Let's reconstruct this argument and see if it fits in somewhere. So that would be your suggestion that this sub argument fits into a, as a piece of this larger argument. It's a good thing to do. If it's possible to, to interpret the whole thing as going towards one conclusion, you sort of like got it more integrated. You maybe have like people try to make just one conclusion usually. Uh, so I was, I guess, I was reading this sort of like pessimistically and saying like this person is just not, they're simply not focused on one issue, right? Uh, so okay, so good. So we got this as maybe a sub argument. What was the argument for eating meat should be illegal? There's a couple of premises in here and a couple of non-premises in here, right? So let's let's just highlight the things that are definitely not premises. Yeah. Also the next slide you mentioned also. So I think that may sort of bring on the same argument because like there are two different reasoning why that it should be illegal. First is because there's no reason to eat meat, and also the fact that it's it shouldn't be a choice, and that's what makes it illegal. The also suggests, to my ear, the also suggests that the second stuff is a, an additional set of reasoning for the first claim. So the first claim is everyone should be vegetarian, so that this is the final conclusion of the argument. So if you say, you know, I'm hungry, also it's past dinner, I'm hungry and we should, we should go out for dinner, also it's, uh, you know, it's getting late, you're suggesting that the first, the second thing is also a reason for the original conclusion, right? You don't usually say, also, and then, like, move down the argument. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. But when you make a law, you base it off an extreme that something should be done. For example, murder is bad. That's why murder is illegal. I'm not sure I follow that comment. For example, if you set up a... Okay, sorry, let's, we've already agreed that this is, we're going to consider this as potentially part of the argument, so can we, let's just move on, okay? Okay, good. So let's try to reconstruct the other half of the argument, the half of the argument for eating meat should be illegal, and then we can see how it looks like it's going to fit together or not, OK? Yeah, good. OK, yeah. Wait, so for that one, yeah. I think it's two dependent okay. like Yeah. Good, OK, so let's get these, let's get these down. So P2. Uh, People are only free to do things that don't harm people. Is that reasonable reconstruction? Things that, let's say that don't cause harm. 
I'm not sure how you can harm a thing. Um, I don't think you can harm things. I can only. I think you can only harm people. What they should say rather is that animals are also people. Anyway, okay. So uh, people are only free to do things that cause harm. And then, is there some short and snappy way we could say that the second premise there? Like, uh, you. Oh, harm. Great. Perfect. Great. So. Uh, People are only free to, think, free to do things that cause harm. Eating meat causes harm. I think that's the core of the argument. Is there, is there more that's not represented in those two premises? Yeah. Um, it says people are polluting our planet. Good, okay. So that, uh, that's evidence for P4. So uh, uh, eating meat. causes pollution and uh, eating meat causes animals to be killed, obviously. And then if we were going to be really complete, we would probably add in some missing premises here, right? So uh, eating meat causes pollution. Pollution's, pollution causes harm. Therefore, eating meat causes harm. Eating meat causes animals to be killed. Animals being killed causes harm. Therefore, eating meat causes harm. Yeah. So a couple of missing premise one and missing premise two to get these normative. So these are, these are descriptive facts, like whether, whether the meat industry causes pollution is a descriptive fact, uh, and we needed something to connect it to this sort of normative claim about harm. If you say something is harm, it's, you're saying it's bad, right? So uh, uh, pollution causes harm, or is harm. Killing causes harm. And notice again, the, the characteristic of the missing premises is that they're supposed to uh, have one part of one premise and one part of the other premise, and then the middle part drops out, as in the puzzle piece method, right? So there's a, there's a, you're in the missing premise, you're giving the overlap between the two premises. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so. What, what premises does that connect? Eating, eating meat causes animals to be killed. Eating meat should be illegal. Eating meat causes harm. Eating meat should be illegal. Uh, maybe we should say that things that cause harm should be illegal. Yeah? Okay, good. Three. Okay, so now let's map this thing. This should be fairly straightforward, yeah? So there's a conclusion, of course. What do we got here? Okay, so who wants to offer me what should lead directly to the conclusion and in what structure? So eating meat causes harm should lead directly to the conclusion. P3 and MP3. P3 in an independent or dependent relation. Dependent, it's gotta be dependent or else I broke the rules of how you're supposed to use missing premises, right? Good. And then how is everything else in the argument arranged? What does everything else in the argument point towards? If this, if this breakdown is correct, P3, that's right. So everything else, all of the other premises, uh, wait, 
Do we need MP3? Actually, I'm, I wonder if we need MP3 at all, given that we've got P2. So people are only or should only be free to do things that cause harm. The free there, we could be interpreted in a legal sense. Yeah. I think that was explicitly given, actually. OK, so let's call this P3 and P2. So people are only free to do things that don't cause harm. Eating meat causes harm. Therefore, eating meat should be legal. So we can maybe R, this should be, should only be. Clearly, people are free to eat meat. People eat meat all day. Uh, so it's, the, it's a more normative claim than, than I had represented it, right? Good. OK, so P3 and P2 at a dependent relation. And then we have to have P4 and MP1 in a dependent relation leading to P3. And then P5 and MP2 in a dependent relation leading to P3. Does that look right to you? So. OK, so uh, eating meat causes pollution. Pollution causes harm. Therefore, eating meat causes harm. Good, simple modus ponens. Yep. Why can't it all point to the other conclusion? Right, we're just mapping this one so far. I was just about to ask about the relationship between this. Yeah, which, I, I mean, it's a legitimate question. So, uh, so all of this you think can lead to everyone should be vegetarian right so uh does that include the conclusion or so the conclusion so instead of so we could just say look here's another thing that leads to conclusion two is that c1 leads to c2 Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I do feel like if C1 works the way you have to add another missing kernel. Right. 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 It's it's not the case that the law overlaps morality perfectly, certainly. Good. Good. So if you want to say uh yeah. Yeah. So C1 and missing premise, call it three. I'm going to get rid of this one. Missing premise three. Uh, people should follow the law. Now, notice what we did there. Um, that, that seems like a legitimate move. But whether you make this move, whether you need this as a missing premise, depends on whether you've interpreted this argument as two separate arguments or one continuous argument. So depending on how you identify the conclusion, more or less missing premises might be necessary to make it go. Yeah? OK. OK, so now the next steps, of course, are assessing the quality of the premises, assessing their relevance to the conclusion, and assessing the strength of the argument overall. Uh, just quickly before we do that, a, a couple of things to like note. Well, what do we leave out of this argument? What, are, what bits do we decide aren't premises at all? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so I, I've been a vegetarian almost my entire life plays no role in this argument. The fact that they've done that does not show that that's a thing that everybody should do, of course, right? Uh, that's a rhetorical move. I guess it's a move to try to establish your authority for speaking on the subject. Um, I don't know. I think that's really not so. And there's a judgment call you have to make there about... Is this just a really crummy premise, which is really irrelevant, or is it not a premise at all? And here, your job is to employ the principle of charity. So if you think that that's just a really silly premise to have included, you have a kind of low opinion of the writer, don't you? You have to say, well, this writer does not know how to reason. The, the only way I can interpret this is this person doesn't know how to reason, or they were just giving context. So I think the more charitable interpretation is to say they didn't mean for that to be a premise. They're just giving you some background. 
Uh, so your job here is to try to construct the strongest version of the argument that you can using the principle of charity. So that's why I think it makes sense to exclude that, that sentence that really does nothing for establishing the conclusion. Don't include it as a premise because you're just making the person look silly when maybe they didn't mean it that way. Or letting them off the hook for something. If they did mean it that way, you're letting them off the hook from the silly thing that they said. Yeah? Okay. Good. So now, uh, I mean, assessing these, assessing these premises, uh, I, I guess you just kind of go through them one by one and say, does this sound plausible? And like, do I believe it? People should only be free to do things that don't cause harm. Like, does everything that causes harm should be illegal? Sorry? Cars would be illegal, possibly, possibly. So you might say that things, only things that cause more harm than good should be illegal. Smoking would be illegal, probably. Drinking would probably also be illegal. Um, you know, I don't know, I don't know what kind of society that you want to live in. Uh, maybe you do think that anything that's not to everybody's total benefit should be illegal. Maybe you think people should be allowed to make mistakes and should be able to determine their own silly lives. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that the question P2 depends on. And, you know, we can have this go, I mean, you have to do a whole course on political science to figure out what the principled answer to that question should be. But, you know, there it is. So uh, eating meat causes harm. Well, to the, to the former bearers of the meat, certainly it does. Uh, eating meat causes pollution. You can back that up with fairly robust scientific evidence, right? You, there's, there's a reasonably broad and reliable body of scientific evidence that says the meat industry is doing all kinds of harm to the environment. Uh, eating meat causes animals to be killed. That one's for pretty definite. That's, that's a, I would say that that's a pretty solid premise. Uh, pollution causes harm and killing causes harm. I mean, pollution causes, causes harm is, again, it's so, it's so transparently obvious to people that they didn't even bother saying it. Uh, killing causes harm. Certainly, if you consider animals as subjects, that's going to be true, right? Like, if you consider the cow's perspective, they would think that killing animals for meat causes harm. Okay. Uh, for this one, no reason to eat meat. I think meat eaters think there is a reason to eat meat. It's delicious. Right? It's delicious and nutritious. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, people should follow the law. Again, like most of the time, I guess. If your laws are well designed, then, then it becomes more and more true that people should follow the law. So the better your laws track what's morally correct, the more that this becomes true. But we don't always succeed in that, obviously. OK, so there's, there's your assessment, just a quick and dirty assessment of the, of the premises. Now, uh, the relevant. So now we have to ask ourselves, are these premises relevant to the conclusion? Uh, these ones, where you have these nice uh, modus ponens relation, where if this, then that, that, therefore this, those are obviously and completely relevant. Okay, those, so your explanation for why these are relevant is, well, you know, eating meat causes pollution, pollution causes harm, therefore eating meat causes harm is modus ponens. It is therefore a deductively, so this subconclusion is deductively valid, or deductively valid, and this subconclusion is deductively valid. So those two parts of the argument are 100% relevant, and they are all of the relevant facts. If, those two, if these premises were guaranteed to be true, then this P3 would also be guaranteed to be true. Now, we just went through and decided that these are, many of these premises are iffy. But if they were true, then P3 would be guaranteed. So this part, at least, is completely relevant. Uh, P3, P2 to conclusion, people should only be free to do things that cause harm, eating meat causes harm, therefore people should not be free to eat meat. Again, that looks like a pretty solid like deductive inference, doesn't it? Right? That's a, that's, again, it's just a really simple modus ponens. So excellent, excellent relevance of these premises. Now, but nonetheless, I think this is, a, this is not a good argument, right? So uh, iffy adequacy on the premise, or acceptability on the premises, very good relevance. But because the premises were questionable, the argument is not adequate to demonstrate its conclusion, or at least it's only mildly adequate, or something like that. 
Right? So it's only adequate to the degree, because the relevance is really, really good, all of the inadequacy comes from the unacceptability of the premises. Yeah? Good. Okay. How long did that take? Great. All right, so speaking of acceptability, let's talk about that for the rest of the class. So uh, recall that acceptability is the degree to which we think a premise is likely to be true. Uh, and I, I'm going to remind you to keep really careful to separate that from relevance. Right? So a premise can be 100% acceptable and yet completely irrelevant to the conclusion. Squares have four sides, therefore you're a terrible person. 100% acceptable. All squares have four sides. I can tell you that by definition. You should be very confident in that. But it's completely irrelevant to the conclusion of whether you are or not a terrible person. So keep those two factors separate. And people, people have genuinely struggled with this because when you say acceptable, it kind of sounds like what you're saying is a good reason. And that's not what we mean by acceptable in this class. We just mean, like, is it... Can I accept that it's true, rather than can I accept that it's a good reason to accept the conclusion? Okay, so keep keep that in mind. Uh, and to remind you again, we'll talk about acceptability rather than truth, because sometimes pr premises which maybe we're not sure that they're true, we can nonetheless con consider them acceptable. And when that's the case, it, it'll depend on context. So it depends on context whether you can accept a premise that you're not completely confident in. So let's go to Denny's. I'm 90% I'm 90 sure it's open. Yeah, that's good enough for me, right? Like Denny's are always in strip malls surrounded by other places to eat. So the 10% chance that you're wrong isn't important enough to reject the premise. Maybe, depending on, I don't know, how hungry, hungry you are or something. Whereas, let's run this nuclear test. I'm 99.9% 99, 99 .9 sure it won't ignite the atmosphere and kill all life. You're even sure, you're 100 times sure, but the stakes are high enough that maybe you want to be even surer than that. I, I shouldn't perpetuate this myth. They didn't actually think that they were going to ignite the atmosphere. They were like highly, highly confident that they were not going to do that. Uh, but they did have to do the numbers. They did have to actually like go through and check that that wasn't going to happen. Okay, so when you're assessing acceptability, Unlike truth, I mean, truth, I take it that it's a kind of objective matter, like something is true or false, or sort of true or sort of false. Uh, but acceptability depends on what you're trying to do, what your goals are, and what the stakes are. So that's why we talk about acceptability in this context rather than just truth. Yeah? OK. Uh, OK, now we're going to do, we're going to get into some, a little bit of philosophy. Uh, Stay with me if you, if you find this too bizarre, just hang in there. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about the two different ways that you can justify premises, justify anything really. There's two broad categories of justification and you should keep them sort of separate in your mind. Uh, empirically or a priori. So a priori is Latin, it's philosophers speak for from before or from pr prior to, from prior to, as in from before you've had any experience of something. So if something's justified a priori, it's justified without reference to experience. Whereas if something is justified empirically, what you're saying is it's justified by some experience or other. Uh, yeah. So here's Aristotle and Plato. Plato's the one pointing up, and that is he's, he's referring to the a priori justification of proper knowledge, the transcendental realm of the forms. And, oh, sorry. Thank you. I'm, I forgot to bring the connector today, so I have to press down on both the laptop and the thing. Anyway, sorry. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, all right, so Aristotle's pointing up, and he's, or sorry, Plato's pointing up because he believed that proper knowledge comes from rational reflection, that experience is a kind of bitter illusion confusing you about the nature of reality. You should ignore experience and focus only on pure rational thinking. And then Aristotle's like, uh, just hang on a minute. We need to actually have experiences to have justified knowledge. This world is relevant to justifying our 
beliefs and all that stuff. So Aristotle's sort of pointing down toward the ground saying, no, 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 we need some, we need some empirical facts in our philosophy or you're missing things. Okay. So uh, distinguish, I think we did this already, but I'm going to do it again. So distinguish three grades of empirical claim, three strengths of empirical claim that you could want to justify. Uh, singular generalizations and universal generalizations. So a singular claim simply says that some specific state of affairs is true, like the cat is on the mat, these cards are on the table, uh, so on. Uh, generalizations say something about a class or category, right? So cats, many cats like mats, right? So you're saying something about not just one object, but a collection of objects or a category of objects. You've generalized. Distinguish that from universal generalizations, which are a stronger, they're sort of the maximum strength generalization. Say something about all members of a class, all cats like mats. And obviously those three types of empirical claims have different truth conditions, and it takes more or less to justify them based on how strong a claim that you're making. Uh, the trick is we, we arrive at empirical generalizations by what's called induction. Induction is just when you make several observation reports and then move from those to a generalization. So Dory likes mats, Ellie likes mats, Tyson likes mats. Therefore, generally, cats like mats. I suppose those were all names for cats. Those are all the names for cats. Um, this is a, a picture of a black swan because the classic philosopher's example of a true Inductive generalization is all swans are white. Turns out in the southern hemisphere that's not generally true. There's, there's tons of black swans in the world. They just didn't live where the philosophers who said that lived. So as a matter of fact, all swans are white is completely false. Generally, swans are white. Uh, not even that is really true. Like if you say generally, usually you mean like most or almost all or something like that. Uh, but there's tons of black swans. They just live in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so inductive inference, in this sense of inductive inference, I said it's rarely on the slide. I think that's even too weak. I think it's just never certain. So just because you saw 1,000 instances doesn't mean that 1,001, it doesn't guarantee that the 1,000 and first instance will be the same as the first 1,000. It's just not a logically certain uh, method of inference. Uh, this is Hume. Hume's problem of induction is all about this, if, you're, if you want to sort of look into that. I won't stress that, but uh, nonetheless, we would die without inductive inferences. Like, we literally couldn't live without doing this kind of inference, so like, don't let the lack of pure certainty worry you too much. Certainly don't give it up. Um, and I, 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 think I'm, I think I'm repeating myself, but I do think this bears repeating. So, uh, with inductive general or with generalizations, there's this sort of really s tricky thing that English does, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is universal or not amongst languages, but certainly it's the fact that in English uh, that we don't explicitly mark the strength of the generalization. We don't always mark it explicitly. So if you want to say uh, cats like mats, it could be a universal generalization, or it could be just a weaker generalization. And nothing in the sentence itself tells you which one is intended. Uh, if you mean a weak generalization and somebody replies, well, you're, not, you're, you're totally wrong, not all cats like mats, uh, then they've committed what's called the straw man fallacy. Right? So that's the straw man fallacy is when you attribute a much stronger claim to the person than they're making and then try to refute that claim. So if I say cats like mats and you say, well, I have a cat and it doesn't like a mat, uh, then they've committed the straw man fallacy, assuming that what you meant was just the generic, the weaker generalization. So this is a, there's a wide scope for getting people wrong when you don't act, like at, in, at least investigate what the strength of the generalization was supposed to be. Yeah? Okay. This can also go the other way. So here's, a, here's an inference. Men are sexist, you're a man, Therefore, you're a sexist. OK, so for this to be a valid inference, a good one, P1 needs to be a really strong generalization. 
right? It probably needs to be, for it to be a deductive inference, it needs to be a universal generalization. It must say, all men are sexist. Of course, the stronger the generalization is, the harder it is to defend. It's easy, or it's not easy, but it's like much easier to defend the weaker generalization than the stronger one. Uh, but sometimes people will do this. It's sort of like the opposite of a straw man fallacy. They'll throw it, they'll defend P1 as a weak generalization. They say, look, here are these systemic issues. They happen all over. Here are the, like, the, the broad sociological markers of, of men being sexist. So they've established the generalization. And then they make this inference, which treats it as a universal generalization. Yeah? So uh, there's room for shifting of the goalposts in both directions. You can either defend a weak generalization and then act as though it's universal, or you can offer a sort of like weak generalization and then be treated as though you're offering a universal. Uh, I, I emphasize this just so that you can have these categories in your mind and spot this when a conversation has gone wrong. It's really, really easy to get this wrong, and asking somebody to clarify exactly what they mean is, as far as I know, the only way to get this right. Like, you have to actually ask, okay, what, what exactly are you saying here? Uh, and usually it's safer to say, assume somebody's making the weaker generalization, right? because weaker generalizations are easier to defend, and you're, you prevent yourself from committing the straw man fallacy by attributing the universal generalization to them. Right? So don't, don't immediately jump to the universal generalization unless somebody's given you a reason to do so. That would be my general advice. Like, again, once again, employing the principle of charity. Treat the other person as though they're making sense, as though they're making defensible arguments until you have no way to do that anymore. Okay. Okay, so that was empirical generalizations, empirical claims. Uh, like, there's a lot more to say about how you get empirical claims and empirical generalizations. Like, for example, all of science is about that. So, like, we're not going to get through all of that. But uh, the other way of justifying a claim is a priori. So, uh, a priori claims are justified without reference to specific experiences. Uh, for example, Descartes' thing, I think, therefore, I am. So Descartes' thing was he didn't trust science. Well, he didn't trust his senses. He wanted to find a sort of firm foundation for all knowledge. So he says, OK, what happens if I doubt everything? What, if ha what happens if I doubt all of my sensory experience? What am I left with? And then try to build back up from there. And he thought he could get, I think, therefore, I am as a kind of first principle for reason, right? So a firm place to stand that didn't require any sense data to justify it. Uh, another would be the, the law of identity, A equals A. So for anything, A equals, for anything that you plug into A, it's gonna be identical with itself. Again, like what, try to think about like, did you, did you get that? Like if you believe that, did you get it from experience? What experience is that exactly? Like what, what sense data corresponds to that? It seems like literally all of it does, or none of it. Yeah? Uh, another would be the principle of non-contradiction. So this little thing here says, it's not the case that A and not A. The little squiggle is not, and the ampersand is and, obviously. So uh, it's not the case that it's raining and not raining. It's not the case that uh, you know Earth is round and it's not round. If you If you're... Assuming that you're not using A in two different ways in the two different instances, that's always true, right? Or at least in classical logic, that's always. So people have developed logics in which they reject this, but this is supposed to be one of those principles that you really don't get from experience. You have them as kind of built-in features of rationality. You get them from pure reflection or something like that. Similarly, math and logic are traditionally thought to be a priori disciplines. You don't learn new mathematical facts by measuring the world. You learn new mathematical facts by doing deductions on first principles. Yeah? OK. Yeah? Pardon? How do you reject A and not A? Uh, so there's a, there's a long tradition. Uh, like, uh, 
Indian and Buddhist philosophy thought there were four truth values. True, false, true and false, neither true nor false. So uh, A and not A could be true, right? Uh, right? Because it's true, if A is true and false, that's true. Um, there is substantial debate about that. Like lots of, most philosophers are not down with that at all, but I just don't want to be incomplete in my, my presentation of this to you. People do have explored formal systems in which it's possible for that to be true. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and another class of claims that don't seem to need to be justified on the basis of experience are stipulative claims. So in chess, bishops move diagonally is true because people said it's true, right? We didn't discover that empirically. And if people started using bishops in different ways, that wouldn't prove that bishops only move diagonally, right? They would just say, no, you're just, you're playing chess wrong, right? So could it turn out that we were wrong that this is how bishops move? Not really. You could change the rules. Of course you can change the rules, but that's just a new stipulation. And we didn't discover that bishops move diagonally by investigating the world. We just decided. Yeah. So I would carve this out as they're not as like fundamental as like A equals A, uh, but nonetheless, they don't seem to be justified on the basis of observations of the world. Sort of. Sort of. Well, OK, so here's the here's this overall structure of the of the debate. I mean, like. Uh, not, not the debate, but like, do I really need to, I mean, I don't know how helpful this is to you. I'll just sort of very briefly say, uh, most, most modern philosophers think that there's only, just to relate this to the analytic and synthetic stuff that we did before, most modern philosophers think that only the analytic a priori and the synthetic a posteriori make any sense. This is the probably the most prevalent view. Uh, so you learn a priori things only when you're doing analytic reasoning. And the difference between analytic and a priori is to, to say something is, is a priori is to say something about why it's true. And to say something is analytic is to say something about how we justified our belief that it's true. Right? So one is about truth conditions and one is about method of learning about it. Okay, so a posteriori means after experience, so from experience, and synthetic is, of course, just not analytic. Um, the philosopher Immanuel Kant thought that there was something up here in this uh, synthetic a priori uh, category, so you could learn new things by rational reflection. Uh, and the philosopher Saul Kripke argued that there are analytic a posteriori truths. So for example, you learned uh, for millennia, we saw that there was a morning star and an evening star, a star that appears near the horizon in the morning and near the horizon in the evening. Uh, and then we figured out that it's the same thing, they were both Venus. So we learned this truth, the morning star is identical with the evening star, but we learned it by astronomical investigation, by figuring out that they were both the same planet. So we learned it through observation but it's an analytic statement because it tells you about the meaning of those names. Anyway, I promise I won't test you on this. I also promise I won't test you on this. Uh, but it's possibly worth thinking about uh, empiricism versus rationalism versus coherentism. So it, it occurred to me that I could explain to you in a couple of minutes this debate, which is probably one of the largest and longest debates in the history of philosophy, using argument diagrams. I was excited, so I, I thought, I'd, thought I'd throw this up here. So, uh, imagine an argument diagram of all of your beliefs, all of your justified beliefs. Huge argument diagram, including all of your premises. Uh, here you've got six beliefs, seven beliefs, including the conclusion. But imagine this is all of your beliefs. Now it's legitimate to ask, what's that top level? What constitutes the top level, if there is a top level, that justifies all of your other beliefs? And so, three basic positions that, I, that I'm aware of. You could be a rationalist, like Descartes, who thought that top level must be like basic rules of reason, 
like the law of non-contradiction, or I think therefore I am. Or you could be an empiricist, like Hume, who thought that top level has to be observations. I saw a dog, you know, it's warm today. I heard a noise. Those have to form the ultimate basis on which everything else is justified. Or you could be a coherentist, so I'm, I'm skeptical that there is just one top level. Uh, the alternate to either being a rationalist or an empiricist is to say, that's all just a big web, right? So, so my rational beliefs sometimes justify my empirical beliefs, my empirical beliefs sometimes justify my rational beliefs. Anyway, so that's like uh, Quine is, believes that knowledge is like a web. Okay, so there you have it. There's the biggest argument in the history of philosophy in two minutes. I hope you enjoyed it. I promise I won't test you on that because I didn't explain it well enough. Yeah. So uh, th imagine that P1, P2, and P4 in that diagram are all experience reports. So saying, I saw a thing. That would, be, that would be how experience gets into it. I mean, there have to be some like non-belief experience, non-propositional non content leading into those premises, like you actually seeing the thing, but. All right, all right, settle down. I got a couple more minutes here. All right. Um, so really, really quickly, I do have only a couple more minutes. Uh, so this is, this is relevant to your argument assessment. So uh, Descartes thought to have secure knowledge, we need to build a foundation of some kind. So he was a rationalist foundationalist. Uh, and he thought the foundation should be rationally secure principles. So he thought that the only way to have justified knowledge was to have something certain to build everything else on. Uh, Aristotle thought the opposite. He thought you start from common sense, right? So you begin with what most people believe and then ask if there's some reason to doubt it only as needed. And this is how I recommend that you behave in any context other than like, if you're doing a project on the foundations of logic or math, or if you're doing philosophy, then it makes sense to ask, okay, what's the ultimate ground of my justification here? Anywhere else, that's just being unnecessarily pedantic and like, you're just dragging your feet in the conversation. So if you're having a debate about whether antidepressants work, don't start by asking how we know induction works. Right? So that's a foundational question about how your reasons are ultimately justified that you do not need to engage in to participate in that conversation. So uh, in argument analysis, being like Aristotle means you accept a premise on the basis that it's common knowledge. So that's, I'm telling you right now, that's a legitimate move to make in your argument analyses. Say, look, everybody thinks this. Uh, of course, common knowledge is not always correct, as you well know. Uh, so you can question it, absolutely you can question it. You can say, look, everybody knows this, but everybody's wrong. But you have to have some reason to do so. Right? There has to be some reason for doubt. OK? Uh, yeah, so just when you're doing your argument analyses, uh, X is common knowledge and there's no obvious reason to doubt it is a good, ex is a good analysis of the acceptability of X in many cases. Yeah? Okay, so, and just to summarize, here are some things that you could write. When you're doing the acceptability section on your argument analyses, here are some sensible things to write. It's common sense and there's no reason to doubt it. It's shown by a scientific study or a series of scientific studies. Uh, it's an observational claim, so somebody says they saw something or heard something or felt something. Those are all reasons to find a premise acceptable, or if it's an a priori truth, or it's something that's been stipulated, and maybe others. I mean, depending on your general philosophy of knowledge. There could be others. These are all the ones that I could think of, though. So, yeah? Well, it would help. It would help. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if it's something really broad, like, you know, like, the tectonic plates are moving, you maybe it's just like, if it's just a commonly held amongst scientists, that might be good enough. Okay, thanks everyone, that's, that's it for today.